everyone to another conversation. And today I have with me Dean Yates, who I guess you'd say is a survivor first responder, a journalist of some note, but he has quite a tale to tell about his experience and his journey of recovery after a major traumatic event. So welcome, Dean. Thank you, Kathy. Nice to be with you. So maybe we can just um, help our listeners understand in a quick snippet how this all came about. So you were the Bureau Chief Chief for Reuters, is that correct? That's right, yes. So I was the Bureau Chief for Reuters in Iraq, 2007-2008. Uh, this is the height of the Iraq war. And I think some people have probably forgotten just, well, they're getting a reminder now of what war is like because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, this was the everyday in Iraq, uh, in Baghdad, when I was there. Bombings, um, the violence was off the charts. 160,000 American troops were in Iraq at that time. Uh, the war was going very badly for the United States. The United States had just sent 35,000 extra troops to, to Iraq. Uh, this, was, this was a very, very dangerous place, very dangerous place for journalists, a, a very dangerous place for the Iraqi people, basically. And, and, and what took you there? I mean, were you a correspondent as such previously in war zones or what was the attraction to Iraq? So I'd, I'd been to Iraq a few times before. I'd spent a year working in Jerusalem. I'd worked in Indonesia for a long time. I'd covered the Bali bombings, the Boxing Day tsunami in Indonesia's Aceh province. Uh, for me, I had l always wanted to cover big stories and, to, and therefore... At that time, in the early 2000s, the mid-2000s, the Iraq war was the big story uh, of that time. And I just had this desire to want to go and tell that story, to be a part of it. But also uh, Reuters, which is one of the biggest news agencies in the world, had a very big team in, Ira in Baghdad, in Iraq at that time. We had close to 100 people, uh, journalists, support staff, right across the country. And I really enjoyed the... Um, the, the leading side of it, the managing side, being responsible for people and helping helping a, a major news organization cover that story really well and try to keep people safe. I found I got a lot of satisfaction out of that. And so if you if you like being a journalist, if you like managing people, the Iraq war was the pinnacle. So it was exciting. You know, like the adrenaline uh, of, of being in a war zone and, you know, go, 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 go. Well, it was, it was certainly go, go, go. I mean, the, 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 honestly, car bombs were rattling in the windows of our office almost every day. Uh, mortars would fly overhead, uh, headed for the green zone. Uh, but it, you had a job to do as well. You had to, you had to tell the story. And, um, and I think for me, ultimately, Everything was outweighed by concerns about the safety of my staff, my Iraqi staff in particular, and their families. A lot of the Iraqi staff had sent their families to Jordan and Syria, two neighboring countries. It's hard to believe, but Syria was safe back then. And those Iraqi staff were constantly worried about their, their families, the welfare of their families. And violence was so random uh, that people were losing their lives all the time just IEDs were exploding, fake checkpoints, carjackings, guns, gunmen in the streets. And so it was always a challenge to try to weigh up the, the story and the safety of staff. And while there were times when, yeah, you definitely feel that adrenaline, you're on a big story and you feel, you feel very much alive. But then there would be times that uh, staff their lives were in danger. Staff, staff were wounded, um, kidnapped, uh, threatened in ways. And, and then, of course, for me, there was the, the most traumatic event of my professional career, which was the deaths, the killing of two of my staff on July 12, 2007, by a U.S. Apache helicopter. Are you able to talk about what happened? Is, is this... Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I've spoken about this uh, a lot. And... It's, uh, it's something that I'm, I'm able to talk about really quite um, freely, if you like, 
uh, quite, I wouldn't use the word easily, but I can talk about it quite comfortably. That's a better way of putting it because I have made peace with myself over what happened. And it's, you know, you know I'm sure that this happened nearly 15 years ago now. So obviously the passage of time has helped, but, but I've really, uh, I spent a lot of time some years ago uh, in, in a psychiatric ward in Melbourne and doing a lot of work with uh, clinicians and a spiritual care worker in trying to understand what my role was in, in this whole event and how I was responsible, how I bore some responsibility for what happened to my staff and how I also bore responsibility for not being the bureau chief that I thought I was, the leader that I thought I was, and also for not speaking up and telling the truth when the American military and government just told lie after lie after what happened in during that attack, which of course was was made famous in 2010 when Julian Assange published video called which he called collateral murder, which showed the entire world what happened. So, what sort of support were you given? Maybe take us back there a bit. Your 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 colleagues were killed you were notified or found out and what sort of support were you given by Reuters? Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, when I first went to Iraq in, uh, as bureau chief, one of the, you know, my wife and I, Mary, we, we talked about all sorts of things. We never talked about PTSD. We never talked about the psychological cost of me going to that sort of place. We, you know, we talked about the threat of me getting killed, but mm. not about the psychological trauma. And back in those days, news organizations, we're putting a lot of emphasis on physical safety, physical security. We did a lot, we did hostile environment courses, all that sort of stuff. Very little emphasis on the psychological cost on, uh, on, on being aware of how trauma would affect journalists. That being said, I got enormous support from my organization. Now, um, that was without any of my managers being trained or anything like that. And I think the reason I got a lot of support was a lot of my managers had been in the field. They had been in war zones. They'd been in conflict zones. They knew what it was like. And they were, they were there for me. I'm getting goosebumps thinking of it now mm -hmm. because it was such a contrast to later, years later when I was diagnosed with PTSD and my bosses were just so indifferent to my mental health, which was absolutely gut-wrenching for me so you've and, got that human response in the immediate yes. aftermath with where humans step up yep. and care about each other and i'm going to explore that and then years later you've got the system approach yep. of shut everything down it's not our responsibility Correct. and and you're the wrong on person. your own and you're on your own that was it it was the corporate response versus the human response hmm. and and i guess the that human support I got lasted for a while, okay. But what had the gravity of what happened was so great that it caught up with me. And combined with all the other traumas that I'd witnessed and covered, mm. I was diagnosed with PTSD, cut a long story short. And then when the time came for me to to disclose to my organization that I was really unwell, um, they just treated me like damaged goods. So I want to explore that a little bit because I mean, how did you, how did it play out that you knew you were in psychological trouble, that you needed to get care, um, and and that this was not going to go away. This is because my because that... my partner told me, <laughs> as they do, <laughs> as they do. I'm serious. The anger, the am, outburst, yeah, the behaviour. Absolutely serious. So my partner, Mary, she was a, a, she'd been a journalist herself for 20 years. She had been mm. working in Asia. She first started out as a court reporter in Tasmania, covering, covering mm. domestic violence, murder trials. Mm. She knew, she knew that I had PTSD for years. She knew I would not listen to her. I was in denial that there was anything wrong with me, which is a familiar story, especially for men. And it was only when things got to a point where my, my symptoms were so bad that I finally, she finally got me to, she finally convinced me that I needed to see a psychiatrist. 
and I went and got diagnosed. He diagnosed me within 45 minutes. It was, mm. it was like, yeah, you've got PTSD, mate. Um, that was, that was it. And where are you with PTSD now? You're learning to live with it. So you still have. Oh yeah, totally. No, no. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't get, so we're talking that's six years ago now. It's been one hell of a journey to get from there to here. And I mean, it's been the biggest story of my life um, because what I've done is I've, I have been obsessed, absolutely obsessed with understanding PTSD, how it affected me, my family, and what it's, what I've had to do to get on top of it. And also to understand the moral dimension of the traumas I experienced, the moral injury that I experienced over the deaths of my staff. And I've spent years in, if you like, reporting a story of my own, my own uh, um, mental health, my own illness. And out of that, I wouldn't say I've come up with any great, uh, great discoveries, but I've worked out how to manage the injury and and return to, and, and and actually find and, and chart a new path in in my life and find a new find new ways to uh actually lead a more meaningful life yeah. and it's it's been it's been an it's been a fascinating journey mm -hmm. I, I have absolutely no regrets except for the pain i put my family through yeah. that's the only regret i have so I just want to connect a few dots. So you ended up as, as head of mental health for, for the Roy. Just Let's just put that together. How did that happen? Yeah, so that was, uh, that basically occurred uh, when I was treated so indifferently by, by the organization after my, uh, after my diagnosis and, and then in my, uh, after my first admission to Ward 17, uh, the psych ward in Melbourne, I, I just thought, I do not want anyone else at Reuters to go through this. I, I do not want anyone to experience what I've gone through because I thought if, if they're going to treat someone like that, like me, who had 23 years of experience, had lost staff, had covered all these major Detroit events, how are they going to be treating other people? Absolutely. And so I managed to convince them that they needed to create a role, a role that was purely focused on mental health and that that person who held that role was a journalist i.e me who had the lived experience of of both working in the field at a high level at a senior level and who was going to try and drive change that was my goal i was going to try and drive cultural change so that the mental health of journalists at reuters became a top priority and did it happen no hmm. Okay. Sadly, no, it didn't, and uh, it, it, it still makes me furious to think that because uh, what I discovered was that um, journalists across the company were were really suffering, really struggling. They were we're talking two, two and a half thousand journalists across the world, um, and I the very first thing I did was I wrote a report, an eighty page report. I just took a bit of a uh, a, a survey of, of a bunch of journalists around the world and the stress that journalists were under was enormous. This was back in 2017. And it's it not was long ago, might I add. It's not that long ago, no. Uh, <laughs> the, the stress was enormous. The burnout, the fear that so many journalists had of losing their jobs. Then you throw on the the, the trauma of the job itself, whether it's whether it's covering wars or conflicts or the vicarious trauma, which to me is the, is the, is the sort of hidden untold story of trauma in journalism is the vicarious trauma. All these young people who are watching all this distressing video in newsrooms and having to, having to edit this footage, edit these photographs, very raw footage. Uh, and of course the brain doesn't make a distinction between what they are, the footage that Absolutely. they've got on their computer screen Absolutely. and what's happening out there in the field. Yeah. These young people are finding, are having to deal with this sort of stuff. And, and then there was just the whole, um, 
the whole hyper competitive 24 7 connectivity yes, of the yeah. world and journalism so you put all that together major stress major uh a major sense of pressure on on staff and look i mean it, it's it's something i talk about in in my book because i think it's i think this is not just this is not just reuters this is across sectors it's across Absolutely. industries where where people's welfare is being sacrificed and the the people who are the, the bosses the management whoever you want to whoever they are do not they just don't understand the consequences of their actions and how damaging it is to people. I, I would have I would have journalists reaching out to me who were suicidal, and um, who, and I still I left Reuters too. I still have journalists reaching out to me from Reuters asking me how I can help them. And there's just a there is just an unwillingness. I found an unwillingness to have a conversation around how can we make the newsrooms a mentally healthy place to work as simple as that how can we make it so that journalists can get enough time off that they need that they can find some balance in life that they can put their hands up and say this this is just too much pressure i just need to be able to to step back i need more support interestingly i i, I found that that reuters was quite receptive to the, the the trauma that people were experiencing in the field but not the not the burnout, not the workplace pressure, not those, not the hours that people were working. They didn't want to have a discussion about that sort of stuff. Really interesting. Both my elderly parents got COVID um, at, in the first wave of, of the outbreak. And I spoke up about the age not being vaccinated. And by accident, I blew the whistle on the federal government. I was really mm. thinking about mum and dad. But what was really telling, so I was on just about every major TV station in mm -hmm. the country. But in some of the conversations, because of my training as a chaplain, I'm saying to people, you go to your own default, how are you? And it was quite common for journalists to say, no one's done a welfare check in with me for the last two months. Um, exactly. And, and, you know, we were seeing the same people day in and day out talking about death and dying and acute distress. And we've had disaster on top of disaster. Um, uh, you do wonder how these people are actually going. And, and really what I wanted to tie together, organisations that are leadership level do not understand well-being and wellness is more than bath bombs and yoga retreats and fruit bowls it's 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 much deeper than that exactly what you were talking about mm. so when did you leave reuters and then we're going to talk about moral injury uh just over two years ago i left um and, and one of the reasons i left and I'm, I, I was very public about this i've been very public about this on social media one of the reasons i left was because i could not uh, the stress that I was feeling because the organization would not take, would not make the mental health of our staff a top priority was just, it was just, yeah, honestly. The responsibility. Oh was... my goodness. It was just, it was making me sick, physically sick. And in the end for my own mental health, I had to get out. That was one reason I had to leave. Mm. Uh, it was just, it was unconscionable, Kathy, for especially, and I, I find this especially unconscionable when it happens in organizations where the bosses understand the risks they, to the mental health of their staff. They understand. They can't say, we don't know about this. They know. It's the same mm. as first responder organizations. It's the same Absolutely. as militaries, right? It's just, they know what the risks are to the mental health of their staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how did you come to go on this journey of moral injury because you've been diagnosed with ptsd and mm. then moral injury showed up on your radar how did that happen well it was actually a, it was actually an old friend of mine called andrew marshall who was uh who was one of the he was the bureau chief in for reuters in iraq uh a couple of bureau chiefs before i got there and it, it was just it was i was i was in such despair it's back in mid 2016 i was in such despair about about how I had not protected my two staff, Namir Nor Eldine and Sayed Chum. I'd failed, I'd failed them. And I this guilt and shame was just eating me alive. And I couldn't understand where was this guilt and shame coming from? Uh, I hadn't, I just I couldn't comprehend it. 
And I reached out to Andrew uh, and, and like a lot of the people I've worked with from that era, he was so supportive. He said, you're not alone. And he said, look, one of the things that I think people don't realize about PTSD, because Andrew's got PTSD, was this, this concept of moral injury, which has started to get a little bit of, a little bit of attention and so on. And I Googled, I, I Googled it and, I, and a couple of articles came up and I saw that the definition of moral injury was all about how you as an individual um, may have, you, you may have done something or failed to do something that transgresses your own, your moral compass, your own, what it is that your own self value. And it was just like, oh, wow, I failed to protect my staff. This is this moral transgression. And then I just started Googling it and I came across all this research that was done on moral injury in American soldiers and veterans by some, some folks in the U S and as soon as I read that, I just knew it. I just knew yeah, it. Yeah, it was a clock it was, moment. It was yeah. like light bulb moment going off. Mm -hmm. And then I emailed, um, so after I read this, uh, one of the, the, I guess the pioneer of, one of the pioneers around moral injury in the world is this, is this professor called Brett Litz in the, in the United States at Boston University. And I emailed him a few months later. I said, can journalists also have moral injury? And he said, of course. <laughs> yeah, so it was sort of like, that was how it started. Yeah. Okay. So, so for the last five years or so, you've been writing a book around mm -hmm. your story and of course, moral injury. Has that been confronting or therapeutic? Oh, it's been, it's been both. It, it really has been both. I mean, I honestly think, and my psychiatrist says this, my psych, clinical psychologist, they all, they both believe. And my, the, the people in my, amazing clinicians in ward 17 have all said this book has been really good for me because it's how i it's it's one of the ways that i have been able to process what i've gone through and i suppose everyone it's processes making. things in different ways i'm a journalist i write so for me the whole idea of, of going back and examining the past and then trying to make sense out of it trying to make meaning out of it the way i do it is by writing about it and when when you write about something in a in a way over in long form like this you really have a lot of time to think about it and to 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 undergo a process of what i call deliberate rumination uh whereby you really get to the bottom of issues and i've found that the writing itself has just been it's just been amazing in helping me understand so many different issues oh yeah but there have been times where it's been it's been too much and it's been stressful and um i've had to stop or some chapters have been too you know too will will will, will make me very fatigued or very headached that sort of thing so it's just trying to find a balance but what i love now is is this whole is writing and thinking about well what is, how, how can we, how can we try and help promote discussion and debate around the moral dimension of trauma? How, how can we broaden people's understanding about the moral injury component of trauma? Um, so I'm at that point now where it, it's really, this is, I, I just find this stuff fascinating. And uh, so it's, it's, it's at that stage where, you know, I've done most of my heavy, intense, Pro trauma processing, if you like, some of it's still there, but most of it's filed away in my linen cupboard, which is a bit of a metaphor I use in the book. Uh, so now it's, it's at that point where, um, okay, you've done this. Let's get the damn thing published and let's start, let's start really trying to create more debate around this, this very important issue of moral injury. So one of the concerns I have, and I think we've spoken privately about it, is I don't want to see moral injury become almost popular culture. You know, like this, mm -hmm. it, it's a very real, very serious condition of human distress, but it's mm -hmm. not a mental illness, which is, mm -hmm. which is interesting, isn't it? It's, it's, it shows up to be human. However, there's no benchmarking of it. It's just this thing at the moment. So, and here's the thing, right? I, I have an issue with when people say moral injury is not a mental illness. 
right um and and the world's the world's leading expert on trauma and in journalists says the same thing guy dr anthony feinstein a canadian psychiatrist says moral injury is not a mental illness well i can tell you what the moral injury that i've gone through it, took me, to, it, it mm. took me to the it took me to the brink of suicide so mm. if that's if that doesn't qualify as a mental illness then what does um those symptoms that i had of moral injury the guilt the shame the anger the intrusive images there's a lot of there's a lot of similar symptoms to ptsd so while i take i, I do i look i understand that the moral injury is not in the dsm right it's not doesn't doesn't have any sort of classification but its impact is as great can be as great as any mental illness under the under the sun in my view so do you think that um uh, like people healthcare professionals psychiatrists and psychologists in particular mental health do you think they're equipped to help somebody with moral injuries is it the right place i think i think actually and and i was just been i've been thinking about this exact question this morning after speaking to my psychiatrist who is fantastic i love my psychiatrist i said how many times have you mentioned the words moral injury to your your patients none mm -hmm. right and i said why not and and I said, surely, you know, you, you mentioned if you think someone's suffering from moral injury, it doesn't help to know, right, what it is that you're suffering from. And, and his view, which I, I'm, I'm sort of summarizing here, and I'm probably making some assumptions, is he doesn't want to overwhelm them with too much in the way of labels or mm. confuse mm. them, if you like. Pathologizing. Uh, so yeah, and a lot of his patients are first responders and veterans there's a lot of anger in that in that cohort right um but i think that it is it is it is vital for clinicians at every stage in a, in in whether you're talking about nurses gps counselors psychologists psychiatrists to understand the moral dimension of trauma because I think that's not happening at the moment. I don't think that we are seeing enough of a, an attempt to try to get to grips with the moral dimensions of, let's, say, let's just say the moral dimension of PTSD, right? I just don't think there's enough, um, there's, there's, there, you don't read anything about this, for example. It's very interesting you say that because we support a lot of victims and targets of domestic and family violence. Yep. And, almost all of them eventually have some sort of mental ill health issue. Yep. However, most of them are suffering from moral injury, in my opinion, yep. because the help that they expect to be there, they're turned away over and over again. And their trust in authority, the betrayal, yeah. the anger, it's big time. The betrayal. You've just nailed it. The betrayal. That is, that is, that is quintessential moral injury. But you notice when I said, when I talked about, when I rattled off those health professionals, right? Counselors, psychs, psychologists. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention chaplains or spiritual care workers because my experience is they get it, right? To be so, human. It, well, and then this is the interesting thing, right? I mean, I was able to make peace with myself over the deaths of my Iraqi staff on my second admission to Ward 17 because of this incredible spiritual care worker called Kath who she understood right from the start that I had to undertake a journey from in here, not up here, right? Mm. She understood that my journey, she understood that her role was not to tell me that I did everything I could. She, she understood that her journey was not to say, look, it was war, these things happened. She understood that I felt responsible. And she said to me, basically, well, I am here to help you undergo a journey, a process, a ritual. We had a, we eventually had a ceremony of memorial service in the chapel at, ward, at, at the hospital to undergo a journey for me to be able to make, find meaning out of what had happened. And what was fascinating about all this was I went into this process with Kath a period of 10 days leading up to a, a memorial service in the chapel where I, which was actually the 10th anniversary the 10th anniversary of this and my stuff i went into this whole process to seek forgiveness from 
Namir and Said, my dead, my, my dead staff. Kath went into this process wanting me to forgive myself, but she didn't tell me that. But the way she set it up, the way she laid the foundations for all this was that by the end of that ceremony, I had forgiven myself. <laughs> yeah, she... Now that was it. Was it was it like that? Did it, was it was it a, a lifting that was easy? Oh yeah, it was like it was like. Oh, it, the culmination was we had had a, we had an hour long ceremony in the chapel, and she poured cold water over my hands. She had she had she had anointed. Um, she'd done the sign of the cross on my forehead yeah. with some hot oil. I am not religious. Um, which was sort of a sign of absolution. And then she poured cold water over my, my hands. And it was like putting my hands in the icy rivers of a, in, in the Tasmanian rainforest here. I felt cleansed. I, I, I felt that, that that weight had lifted, that burden had been taken off my shoulders. And I walked out of that chapel and I was just ready to go to the airport and go home. I, I was that, I was that, it, it was, it was just, it was amazing. And from that moment on, nearly five years ago, I have not had any major intrusive images, thoughts about what happened to my staff. Uh, How's that played out in your overall mental health now? Massive. It's, it's massive. Mm. It, it, it really is. And, and but but this was a spiritual care worker yeah. who did this for me, who helped show me the way. And I think I think that the psych profession, the medical profession, can learn a hell of a lot from what chaplains do, from what spiritual care workers oh. do, because they I don't know, I just think they listen better. They well, are, we are taught active listening. I mean it's it's yeah. I mean it's our job to listen and to help you clarify what it is that you need to do for you. That's our job. Um, and very often we never hear the outcome. Like we're there in that moment of acute distress, mm. um, whereas a psychiatrist or a psychologist is along the journey and they're operating from a human deficiency as opposed to the state of being human. And, mm. and there's a big difference. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was, yeah, I, I just found the whole experience was so cathartic and, and purifying. I, 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 I can just wow. rattle off all these ways of, to describe it. And I think at the core of it, the most important thing in the whole, this whole, that whole journey, that whole experience was Kath, my connection to Kath and the ritual, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how she brought all of that together in a very meaningful way. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be to be said for people who have gone through these very morally injurious experiences who just can't find, they can't find a way out from traditional uh, therapy or medicine or whatever it is. And this is where I think I would love to see the medical profession just be a little bit more flexible and a little bit more accommodating to alternative pathways mm -hmm. out of trauma. Well, I guess we've got to say that um, neither of us are um, medical experts, so you should always listen to. Absolutely. No, I agree. Yes. Of course. Um, having said that, um, from my own experience, I do find that we all have the answers within. Most of us know what it mm. is we need to do, that, that deep sense of inner connection. I'm not talking about biological mental illnesses, but I am talking about things such as P PTSD and so forth, which do require treatment, as, as we know. Yes. So, 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 Dean, you've spent all this time writing this magnificent book, which is now finished you think <laughs> almost getting there and yeah. I've my, read agent, it. my agent yeah. has told me my agent has told me to cut forty thousand words out which is fine <laughs> I can do that. that's quite something yeah. yeah i can do that how long yeah. is it how long has it taken you to write that five and a half years my goodness is it your first novel yeah. uh yes it is and i won't be writing another one <laughs> <laughs> and, and and did you 
did you set out because you just wanted to tell the story uh, or did you feel that that this need, needed to be birthed and it needed to be out there? Yeah, no, there was a, it was very much the latter. I, I just, what I, what I really discovered, and I think it shocked me a little bit, was during my first admission to Ward 17 in 2016, was that those survivors in Ward 17 had no one to tell their story. Those coppers, those ambos, those veterans. Yeah, yeah. They had no one to speak for them, no one to, 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 to give voice to the pain that they had gone through, were going through, for example, dealing with the inhumane workers' compensation system in this country. <laughs> Did you yeah. end up on workers' comp? Uh, briefly. <laughs> not, not, yeah, I got, I got chucked out by, by QBE. They decided that, they decided that my, uh, because my former exposure was overseas, that I didn't qualify for workers' comp. Yeah, that would be uh, right. Okay. Yeah, we, won't so, we won't go yeah. there. We won't go there. Yeah. So I really felt that as a journalist that I could tell my story and at the same time give voice to theirs. And that to me has been, that's driven, that's one of the reasons I've been so driven on this mission, if you like, is because this is not just about my story or my family. It is about giving a voice to so many other people out there who have gone through similar circumstances. And, and, and one of the things I discovered in Ward 17, didn't matter whether you were a journo or a copper or we had people in there who who had been school teachers chefs truck drivers yeah, yeah, who yeah. had ptsd right we all had the same symptoms yeah yeah didn't matter what we did on the outside we were and we'd all mm. i was almost going to swear there and i managed to stop myself most of us had messed up our relationships we were all really struggling to find our way in life and so i just feel that that my my duty is to be able to just give voice to all those other people and if and if I can just provide a bit of a bit of a pathway or a roadmap for others then then I've done my job I'll be happy with that so three last questions what's next Dean I mean you've, you've got this book you've got to cut 40,000 words yep. but where to next? Yes, yeah, so I've been working actually for some time with a with a filmmaker, an independent filmmaker called Helen Barrow on a documentary on uh, journalism and trauma. Um, mm. We were actually we were actually very close to getting that done before COVID hit, so that that got um, obviously got delayed. But um, we'll we'll get back into that at some stage. But Helen and I are also going to do a do, we're going to do a podcast that will basically uh leverage off the book use the book as a bit of a mm -hmm. a bit of a foundation um and you know we want to try and explore some of the issues that the book has raised so okay. for example moral injury we want to do a podcast we want to do one episode on moral injury i want to do an episode on the workers compensation system um and that will We'll hopefully be able to get that done by, um, I think, by the end of this year. Then we might need to we might need to restructure the focus of the documentary a little bit. But then, if we can put all these three together, then hopefully make a real statement about trauma, the workplace, how 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 things can be just improved for for survivors, and and hopefully spark a bit of debate. No mistakes, Dean. I wonder why we're talking. <laughs> <Give it. laughs> yes. Hello, hello. Yeah. So, 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 what do you now do for your own self care? Because all this therapy, you would be acutely aware mm. of your inner world and what you've got to look after. Oh yes, the self awareness is is uh, very acute. So, uh, I have. I'm very, very lucky to live in rural Tasmania. So that helps a lot. I just walk outside. I can see a river down there. I can see the mountains. Mm. Um, my family is self-care right oh. that's that's to me being spending time with my family uh i know when i've just got to stop right shut the computer off i don't i, I don't have social media on my phone um i consider therapy self-care yeah. so i one of the things it was really interesting my third admission to the psych ward my psychiatrist this wonderful iranian born Iranian born woman called Mariam. She said, How many times have you seen your psychologist in this year? And I said, Oh, maybe twice. And she said, See, this is the problem, right? 
you need to be seeing your psychologist regularly, even when you're feeling good, because that will help put a foundation under you so that if you go into crisis, she said, she said, when you go into crisis, you end up in Ward 17. Whereas if you're seeing your psychologist regularly, Absolutely. little, little, the little, you know, you can just yeah. sort of smooth the out the up. Yeah. So, so for me, therapy is, is part of my self care. And then, I, I, you know, being involved in my kids' lives, mm. my kids mm. are 19 and 21. And I got two adopted kids from Indonesia who are both 21. I just love being part of their lives. Uh, it's a great yeah. leveler, isn't it? It's like, yeah, like it's my, my problems and this aren't the end of the world. Other people are learning about life as well. Yeah, absolutely. So what yeah. so spirituality, you've already told me you're not terribly religious, but what does it mm. mean to you? Because it means many different things to different yeah. people. Yeah, I think to me it's about... Uh, it's it's about being a really strong presence in the lives of those that you love mm. um and really wanting to 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 do your to do your best and i know that might sound like a bit of a, a cliche but um just to to give back to to help people, to mentor people, to one of the things I do at the moment is I'm the gig manager for my younger son's rock band, and which <laughs> I absolutely love doing. And I love being around these young people and being able to just slip in little bits of advice here and there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they might use <laughs> or they might not. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that that's sort of that is that's uh, to me that's being spiritual in the sense that i feel like it's it's me being in touch with who i want to be and and the mm. person that i want to be um and the other side of it is for me is getting out into the rainforest and i was out last week uh in the tarkine in uh, west coast of tasmania just touching trees just mm. smelling leaves and and uh putting my hand in, in rivers and swimming in the rivers um i find that that is where i i can really get some get get not so much peace but a feeling of tranquility and stillness that it is sometimes a bit hard to get in the in the real world thanks for joining us Dean. you're welcome kathy thank you